and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This will be the seventh lecture in our wood design series. Today's video is going to give an exploration of the history of the design of wood structures and how the engineering of wooden buildings and structures has developed to its present state. Today's video is going to be an exploration of the history of the design of wooden structures and how the engineering of wooden buildings and structures has developed to its present state. First, let's go back, and I don't mean back to last Thursday, but back, back to literally before the beginning of history. What you're looking at here is the single oldest wooden construction ever discovered. This is what remains of a well discovered by archaeologist uh, William Tegel and colleagues from the University of Freiburg, Germany. While certainly not much to look at, this is the single oldest wooden construction ever discovered. Uh, what this is, is this is the lining of a well built out of solid oak. It was built without nails, glue, or any kind of mechanical fastener. Um, it was held together entirely with various wooden connections such as mortises, pins, etc. And it dates back to approximately 5100 BC. You're looking at a well built by someone over 7,000 years ago. Um, and in case you're not up to date on your Neolithic history, yes, this was literally the Stone Age. This was built before people figured out how to make and form iron, bronze, or copper. This was built entirely with stone tools. These images are of the actual wooden elements found. This here is a 3D reconstruction of what the uh, well would have looked like new. And this is an idealized sketch of some of the connections. So, certainly rough by modern standards, in fact it looks like something I would build, but it's still a hell of a lot better than anything I could make out of stone tools. Um, I might end up with something that looks like that after working with power tools. Um, anyway, uh, so, and of course it is also a bit miraculous that this thing managed to survive so long. Soil conditions must have been just right to keep it from rotting away. Studying the history of ancient carpentry is made intrinsically difficult by the fact that as a biological material, wood doesn't tend to stick around long in the archaeological record. So, why did I feel it necessary to show you a 7,000 year old well? Well, it shows that people have been building out of wood literally longer than recorded history. Wood, stone, and bone are really the three original structural materials used by humans, and this well, crude though it may seem, was designed to solve many of the same problems we as engineers deal with today. Let's think about what this well had to resist. It had to first hold itself up against gravity load, next had to resist the inward thrust of soil pressure, and uh, finally it had to survive the punishment uh, and onslaught of the elements. We may have computers, lasers, and prefab elements built by robots, but fundamentally we as 21st century structural engineers are ultimately trying to accomplish many of the same things as the ancient carpenter who built this well over 7,000 years ago. When you build with wood, you are walking in the footsteps of history. From our current practice, an unbroken line stretches back century after century, millennium after millennium, until it is lost in the mists of time. Let's move a bit forward in time. This is Horyuji Temple. It's located in Ikaruga of Japan's Nara Prefecture. This is a Buddhist temple constructed approximately 1300 years ago in the early 700s. Horyuji Temple is the oldest wooden building on the planet still standing and in present use. Think about this period in history. Think about what the world was like when this temple was being built. Um, in fact, let's look at some contemporary events. In a few generations, the first Viking raids on England would occur at Lindisfarne. In the Middle East, there are still a few old-timers around who remembered seeing the Prophet Muhammad speak as children. In the Valley of Mexico, Teotihuacan was approaching its collapse. And in China, the Tang Dynasty was enjoying a golden age. This temple stood from then until now, and through all of the events in between. It was even fortunate enough to survive the fire bombings of World War II uh, thanks to two factors. 
Uh, first, much of it was physically disassembled and put into storage in the countryside, and it was also one of the few sites excluded from Allied bombing targets, specifically on cultural and historical grounds. So let's think about construction in this period, and really through most of human history. Buildings like this weren't designed by engineers, structural or otherwise. In fact, no one would even say the word engineer for centuries. But it goes much further than just not having someone titled engineer present. It goes deeper into the actual design process. For buildings like these, there was no one sitting there with an abacus calculating stresses in the medieval Japanese equivalent of pounds per square inch or megapascals. Everything we do today is based on the application of mathematics and physics, but this was almost a thousand years before Newton was even born. Clearly, they weren't doing calculations of stress, strain, and allowable deflection, as we do now when we design structures. So, how then did they actually manage to do it? Obviously, they had to be pretty good at what they did, because some of their structures, as we can see here, are still standing to this day. You don't manage to build a building that will stand for 1300 years if you are really bad at designing buildings. Well, ultimately, they used the most common historical method of design, and that's good old-fashioned trial and error. Except it was more of a intergenerational uh, trial and error. Over generations, craftsmen such as carpenters and builders learned to construct buildings simply by trial and error. Some buildings stood up, and some fell down. Now, the techniques used on the ones that stayed standing were eventually baked into relatively prescriptive rules. These rules were then passed down generation after generation, from father to son, from master to apprentice. By prescriptive, I mean that the rules were based on simple, direct instructions or very simple arithmetic calculations without any kind of detailed engineering analysis. For example, a builder might have had a rule stating, okay, for a roof X feet high, support the roof with columns Y inches wide and spaced Z uh, feet apart, and they'd have numbers, of course, in for X, Y, Z. For any type of wooden structural element, or actually any elements of any material for that matter, rules like this existed. Memorizing these rules was a key component of mastering that building trade. So if you're going to be a carpenter, when you are learning from, if you're an apprentice carpenter learning from a master carpenter, or if you're, if, if you're a son working with a father, as you learn the trade, you learn many of these just sort of rules of thumb. These were just these prescriptive rules of thumb, and that were just developed over the centuries and then passed down from uh, one generation to the next. Also, these rules were extremely localized. These rules would be formulated for the exact species and sizes of wood common in an area. So if you're in, I don't know, a medieval city or something like that, your local carpenter's guild or whatever may have you, um, will have all of their rules calibrated for the area immediately around your city. It was all extremely localized, only directly applicable to one localized area. As we move into the 19th and 20th centuries, the history of wood engineering parallels the history of civil and structural engineering in general. As theories of stress and strain began to be developed, these methods began to be implemented in wood construction. The design of wooden structures ceased to be the sole realm of the carpenter's trade and began to be an area of engineering practice. In the 19th and into the early 20th centuries, the concept of working stress began to be employed. The working stress being the maximum safe stress that could be applied to the material. This is similar to allowable stress design, though it did not include the types of load factors we see in modern allowable stress design and load resistance factor design. Rather, what you'd have is you just, you would estimate all of your um, loads that, you, that are being applied to a member, uh, and then you just go and compare that to an, a, a single um, maximum stress, single working stress uh, for that given material, and based into that working stress would be a, uh, a safety factor. So you wouldn't have a, a specific safety factor that you apply, but it was just baked into the rated stress for the material. Various organizations, often lumber mills and assorted lumber industry associations, began publishing guides 
for the allowable working stress of various woods. These guides were based on a mixture of early lab testing and traditional knowledge and methods. For example, consider the Northern Hemlock and Hardwood Manufacturers Association of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. This association encouraged the use of hemlock and other hardwoods and other products produced by its association members. An example of their work is shown here, a book titled Birch Interiors, a book of information upon birch for the use of architects and builders. <laughs> this book, as shown here, was published in 1910, and it was intended to illustrate and promote the use of birch woods for various interior building finishes. Trade organizations such as this one also performed early lab testing to produce working stress guides for various species that their uh, association's members manufactured. These would provide base allowable stresses and modification factors that could be applied to compensate for defects such as knots, uh, checks, etc. So you'd have one um, value for tension, for shear, for bending stress, that sort of thing um, for various species, but those were defined in terms of just um, perfect clear wood. And then there'd be various factors that would reduce that strength for uh, various local defects. Still, such design guides remained largely provincial affairs. There was not a single national unified specification for wood design. If an engineer wanted to design out of a particular species of lumber, they would have to either perform their own testing or rely on in-house data or a manufacturer or association's uh, data and specifications. In some cases, individual cities would adopt similar working stress guidelines within their building codes. While this proved perfectly adequate for design, it did have certain downsides. Design values being so localized have certain inherent uh, disadvantages. Namely, they inevitably cause certain friction in the design process. Different engineers might end up designing to different stress values, even when using identical species and sizes of wood. An engineer might find it difficult to design in multiple cities, as each city might have unique working stress values for different tree species present in their local building code. In other words, as a matter of law, I could take the exact same pine board and it might have three different allowable stress levels in, say, Corvallis, Oregon, Houston, Texas, or Des Moines, Iowa. It would be the same exact board or the same exact timber or post, whatever it might be, but it might have three different stresses and then thus loads or forces that it was rated to carry in three different cities. Imagine being a manufacturer, um, especially of something like roof trusses, or well, I guess those didn't tend to be around then, but... Um, just in terms of, uh, maybe you're designing, um, let's say you're designing brackets of some sort, or nails, or connectors, or of some sort, mechanical connections, that sort of thing. Um, if you go and uh, try, if, if you want to produce literature for the products that you're selling, you'll obviously want to put a stamp on there that says, okay, this bracket, if it's used with this piece of wood, or this size board, is going to have X capacity. But, um, Instead, you can't do that because it has a different capacity based on the, the strength value of the uh, size of material and the species that it's attached to. And so you would need to have, so basically your bracket or something might have different allowable capacities in literally every city across the country. And so imagine trying to do packaging in a world like that. It's just an absolute nightmare. So highly localized design processes inevitably produce inefficiency and another aspect of this is that engineers should really have an agreed upon value for how strong materials are. Imagine you and me disagree drastically on the flexural strength of Douglas fir, and we both regularly design buildings out of Douglas fir according to our assumptions. Let's say I say that Douglas fir has an allowable bending stress of 2000 PSI. In my experience, for whatever reason, I think it could hold 2000 PSI safely in bending. You, on the other hand, say it has an allowable stress of 1500 PSI in bending. You assume a lower strength than me, meaning that you will end up generally uh, with designs heavier than mine. Um, so I'm going to end up designing things, uh, I'm going to end up designing a little bit uh, more slender, uh, you know, a bit more elegant members. You're going to have a bit more chunky, large cross section members. But at the end of the day, one of two things has to be true. 
either you're designing buildings so durable they will end up as a contender for the list of world's oldest still standing wooden structures, or I'm designing structures so weak they'll fall over in a stiff breeze. In other words, either you are being too conservative or I'm not being conservative enough. If we're disagreeing on basic values, basic uh, physical stress values, one of two things has to be true, or one of these two things has to be true. And either way, the public's interests are not being served. If, um, let's say, a city hires an engineer to design them a new town hall, and the public is paying for this project out of their out of the public treasury, either way, the public isn't being served. If they're ending up, if they're paying for a building that is way more durable than they'll ever need, their interests are not being served. And if you're designing a flimsy piece of crap that won't be able to uh, uh, last more than a, a couple of years, their interests also aren't being served. Both over-design and under-design are not in the public good. And finally, this kind of thing honestly just makes engineers look bad. It's hard to build public confidence and trust in your profession when engineers in different cities can't agree on basic physical quantities like the strength of a material. Imagine if doctors disagreed on diagnoses based on their geographic area. Um, let's say a doctor in your city diagnoses you with cancer. Um, hopefully that won't happen, but let's say it happens in the city that you live. Uh, you then travel to another city to either get access to specialized treatment or to be near family. And then you go in for treatment and the doctor there tells you, uh, sorry, we see the exact same lump on this x-ray that your doctor did in your home city. Unfortunately, while you meet the definition of cancer in your city, you actually don't in this city. Thus, I really can't treat you for it here. And sorry, but I really didn't have a choice in the matter. In our city, by city law, tumors must be 0.1 millimeters larger than in your city to qualify for cancer. So thus, it, while in your home city you have cancer, you don't have cancer in this city. Um, that would be a nightmare and would severely decrease the public's trust in doctors and their expertise. In short, highly localized design processes inevitably produce inefficiencies and barriers to trade and commerce. As such, the trend throughout the 20th century was towards increasing standardization of design values and methods. What you are seeing here is a report titled Guide to the Timber Grading and Structural Timbers and Determination of Working Stresses. This report was published by TRC Wilson in 1934 at the U.S. Forest Service's Forest Products Laboratory. This report was the culmination of 20 years of research work and compiled data from governmental, academic, and industry sources. This report can uh, be seen as a sort of spiritual successor to the modern NDS. The report provided what it called basic stresses for most of the commercially important species of wood, as can be seen here. These basic stresses were the results from laboratory testing of small, clear wood specimens. To compensate for wood's uh, structural defects, local defects, global defects, etc., um, a variety of modification factors and formulas were provided. These formulas originated from investigated research at the Forest Products Laboratory. Few things in history have had a greater impact on various industries than war. There's a reason we often frame major periods in American history in relation to wars, such as referring to the last 75 years as the post-war period, or referring to uh, the period before the Civil War as the antebellum period. Uh, historically, wars are, have produced massive changes um, in industries and society as a whole, and the lumber industry is no exception. In the Second World War, the major powers faced great pressure to make absolutely every aspect of their production chains as efficient as possible. Standardization and streamlining became the rule of the day. Women entered the workplace in large numbers. The federal government commanded industries on what to produce and when. The nation's entire productive capacity, really the, the, the uh, productive capacity of our entire society, was honed and directed towards the war effort. 
In the lumber industry, people realized that efficiencies could be gained by adopting a national standard. It took several years to develop, and this here was the eventual result. This is the National Emergency Specification for the Design, Fabrication, and Erection of Stress-Grade Lumber and its Fastenings in Buildings. This initiative was directed by the War Production Board's Conservation Division. This document became a required standard for all wooden construction for the federal government, for the War Department, and other war-related construction. Unlike the earlier report, this document did include specific work and stress values for different grades of lumber rather than just single species. Uh, though um, the grades used then are often quite different than the grades you'll see in today's uh, NDS, at least some of them you won't see. This specification also included numerous design formulas and design aids, as well as some provisions for elementary combination of loads. This document is historic and of relevance to our discussion here because it was the direct predecessor of the modern NDS. New editions of the specification have been issued periodically, not every year, but every three, four, five, six, um, so years, less than, uh, you know, less than once a year and more than once a decade, typically. These editions adopt the results of new academic research, address changes in the lumber industry and its uh, workings, and provide design guidelines for new lumber products that may have been introduced since the previous edition. While originally developed only for the war effort, in time the NDS would be adopted by various building codes and is now the wood design standard uh, used by numerous states and localities. For example, it is referenced by the IBC, the International Building Code, aka the building code which is currently adopted or at least in partial use in all 50 states. There have been numerous changes to the NDS since World War II, reflecting countless changes to the lumber industry and the results of a myriad of research. One important foundational change has been a change to how lumber stresses are created. The data for the 1944 NDS and subsequent additions came from the Forest Products Lab. In the 1960s, however, the Forest Products Lab stopped directly rating wood stresses, and that responsibility was shifted to the ASTM the American Society of Testing and Materials. Other general trends have been ever-increasing uh, national standardization of sizes, stress rating procedures, and design methodologies, and I guess in more recent decades, adoption of uh, LRFD criteria. So we can see that the general pattern in the lumber and construction industry has been towards ever-increasing standardization. While people have been designing wooden buildings for millennia, our methods of designing such structures have grown and developed with our societies as a whole. The next video in the series will be a more proper introduction to the NDS, going over the various sections within it, including the relevant supplements used in design. And with that, I think we'll wrap up for today. Hopefully you found this video enjoyable or perhaps a bit informative. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to make the robots happy. If you would like to help make more videos like this possible, see the link to our Patreon page in the video's description. Channel patrons get the satisfaction of making educational content like this possible, as well as a few perks such as behind the scenes information, uh, periodic status updates, access to scripts and notes, and input on future channel content. <laughs> Regardless, I hope you found this video enjoyable, and I look forward to seeing you all again in the next lecture. I look forward to seeing you all then, and as always, thank you.